Welcome to the last talk in um, HS1 for, for today. Uh, Vadim Katsurkin from IP Labs will talk a bit about writing less code with serverless on AWS. Good. Give a warm round of applause. What I would normally say, but since we are online, <laughs> it doesn't work. So let's just get started. Enjoy. So thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Um, so uh, welcome to my talk, Writing Less a Code with Serverless on LWS. Yeah, thank you for joining me. It's the last talk, so I know it's a bit late. So you are probably <laughs> tired and the weather is good, it's just uh, in, in Bonn region. So first of all, um, we had a bit of trouble uh, when I share my, my screen with PowerPoint. So we just found a way to convert this to, to PDF and then um, upload. So I lost all my animation. So we will see how just, uh, yeah, uh, to get this right. So you will see the whole screen um, uh, yeah, at once. But I think we will, uh, we will get it. Uh, so several words about me. My name is Vadim, and I'm working for IP Labs at Bonn. So it's kind of regional conference for me, but but we are doing this online for the second year. Um, so um, I, I have two in fields of interest: Java and serverless, and that's why I yeah uh, give a talks to one or other topics. Um, this is the sixth talk in the row uh, at Frostcon for me. Um, Epilepsy is the, the uh, company which which uh, resides in Bonn. And, um, yeah, we are also the the, the sponsor of this conference uh, also this year. And um, if you would like, you can drop me an email or follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Just if you have any questions which we can clarify during this talk, so please drop me a message and we can talk about this. Uh, so, yeah. Um, as I told you, I work for Epilabs, and what we are doing, we, are, we, are, we, we create software for designing and purchasing of the pro photo products, like calendars, photo books. So just uh, the, 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 yeah, just you can print your emotions in form of, 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 of pictures, and we offer this in all possible devices. <clears throat> and we are 100 subsidiary uh, percent subsidiary of the Fujifilm Europe. Um, so we will be talking about serverless, and especially in LWS context. So the the people who are just doing serverless with uh, Azure or cloud or on Kubernetes will see some common things. As I have experience with AWS, there are some things which are uh, tied to to how the this cloud provider is doing the things. So this is our agenda for today, and um, we will briefly talk about challenges of the software development in general just without touching serverless and then we will see the serverless its value proposition we will dive uh, in several aspects uh, much deeper like own less build more or lower technical debt and then we will provide just the the the, the example of uh, serverless architectures just to minimize uh, of minimize the code being written and in the end if we have and we will be talking about how to be successful with serverless in general so let's start uh, the talk and uh, the first part is just let's briefly talk about the challenges of the software development in general first um so just it was too quick i really recommend this book uh, team topologies by matthew skelton and manuel pass and they if they, we are talking about server uh, about uh, programming we are sometimes talking about cognitive law this is just the total amount of of mental effort being used in the working memory and we differentiate between three of them, like intrinsic cognitive load, extraneous, and germane. And um, the first one is intrinsic. This is how to write just program this Java class or use a simple framework like Spring or you uh, write very simple tests. And when talking about extraneous, um, yeah, the things become much more complicated. It's just about how to write automatic tests, uh, integration end to end, and depending on the platform, also web mobile and desktop tests, how to build, package, deploy, and run our applications, how to configure monitoring alerts or the whole observability stuff, but also auto scaling and so on. How to operate and maintain infrastructure. We are talking generally, so just 
yeah, without it, you can use cloud, which helps, or even do it on yourself. How to build fault tolerant and systems and, and, and build resiliency in, and how to make hardware network and applications. So you see there are a lot of topics uh, just in, in the bottom. If you just uh, doing microservices or something like this distributed system, you, you see a lot of type stuff you can you have to take care of. And this is just yeah general stuff. And I see a lot of companies who get stuck when uh, and just don't come to delivering some kind of business value because it's just you have to take care of this. And the last uh, type of cognitive load is germane cognitive load. It's about your domain knowledge. So what is your company doing? So our our main job at Epilabs is provide you the editor, so just that you can build your products like prints, like 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 calendars, like photo books, like greeting cards, and so on. This is our business area, and not kind of e-commerce stuff like like purchasing and so on. And of course, we, we have to, uh, to, to un deeply understand our processes for our domains and our workflows and be, and be really productive in this. And so um, what's our goal intrinsic? Yeah, we have to become fluent. Yeah, we have to become expert in writing the code and the programming languages being used. And in the case of extraneous, yeah, all the stuff um, uh, for building, yeah, for running microservices, in general, we have to minimize the amount what we are doing on our own. And the same is for Germain. So just uh, figure out what is your core domain, what is your competitive advantage, and probably other domains like like uh, CMS, like e-commerce, like checkout, payment, and so on. This is probably some kind of generic stuff that you can buy and just don't focus on this. We will talk about what does it mean and if you do it other ways. Uh, so generally, what our managers want uh, want from us that we are productive. And uh, if we are talking about productivity, generally this the very simple definition: we are productive if we really products, yeah, which are successfully used by our customers. But the question is, what what is holding us back from being productive? So I have a lot of references uh, below, and I will share my presentation. So um, you can look at this deeply. So there is a report which is probably three years old about um, the things which, which is holding us from being productive. And you see the huge amount of percentage, 19% is just technical debt. And, um, and if you look in the Wikipedia, then uh, they describe technical debt, some, yeah, some, some on, on I would say and, and then some decision which which we know that it's not very very good decision today um that we have to correct in in the future but um generally from my perspective it's not the best definition because even the perfect solution today can tell them over time and we know this you can choose the hottest the newest version of the programming language uh, and then you just it will be updated and just uh, uh, yeah it it will the new versions will have not backward compatible changes and so on and we have also security considerations that just will prevent us from from doing things if we don't update and we don't if we do meet uh, perfect decisions like TLS 1.0 and so on. It wasn't available in the older versions of programming languages and so on. We also rely on open source projects. It's the conference for this and some project uh, will be discussed uh, with time and just then you, you can get stuck. You, you have to just iterate. You have then to select other solutions. So just uh, everything evolves with time and even the perfect um, perfect decision today will become a technical debt tomorrow. And um, so, uh, for me, it's technical debt is uh, yeah. You you have to think about what happens with your software over the entire entire life cycle of your product. And it could be even forever if you don't discontinue. Just that's yeah. That's never any story. Um, so for me, technical debt is related to amount of code written from our side, and of course also amount of dependencies used. So all, all, everything that we use via Maven, via uh, NPM, it's just something which belongs to our software, 
and um, this is only open source project that it, it can it can also be databases in some certain versions like postgres and also web application servers like tomcat which we use in some certain versions that, that bring some dependencies uh, which belong to the to the standard which this web application server supports um, so another point which which also prevents us from being pro, uh, productive is just that we use legacy systems and for me legacy system is some it is the system that cannot evolve so we get stuck by something like we cannot up, update and or it requires a very huge amount of time to update many people know this yeah, if, if if somebody uses Java 5 or something like this and just, yeah, you cannot upgrade it very easily. Even with Java 8, it's currently a problem. And <clears throat> there is another book which I can recommend, it's probably three years or four years old, Evolutionary Architectures. And they are talking about just how to write software that, that can be changed, that can be maintained. And they, but just the, the availability instead of maintainability. But, uh, they can be similarly uh, understood. So this is the architecture which which supports incremental change, also supports appropriate architectural coupling, and we'll be talking about why coupling is important. And it just you also need kind of fitness functions in order to check that if you iterate, then nothing breaks. And under the fitness function, you can understand source code metrics like cyclo measuring cyclomatic complexity all kinds of, of tests like unit tests, percentage of coverage, but of course also performance metrics, also security in context in context of cloud, also encryption and so on, and all kinds of CI CD tools which can automate things and make make just things um, reproducible and just use quickly get the feedback if something works or doesn't work. Yeah, this is kind of example of fitness functions. Yeah? And many of them you know so sonar arc unit all kinds of ci cd tools like jenkins or managed from aws it doesn't matter these all tools that we use just to get the feedback from the system that, um, that the incremental change uh, didn't uh, break something so now we, we talk generally about the things so let's talk about serverless why and, and made the serverless help on what's just valuation of serverless. And we will be talking also about the total cost of ownership. So now we'll be losing all, oh, I see currently it works. So the, the, if we are talking about serverless, the full um, total cost of ownership, it begins with no infrastructure and operation and maintenance. And the question you should ask yourself is infrastructure maintenance and operation your core competency? And probably the answer will be no, unless you are working for the data center provider or the cloud provider itself. Yeah, this is the core competency. Probably your core competency is to build pro uh, your product. So um, also auto scaling and fault tolerance built in. And just this is also if you see why why we are not producting. This is because we are shipping. Yeah, the the. the yeah, so see loses from software failures. It may be simple bugs, but it's also maybe something that just in the Christmas season the software broke. Yeah, and th there are a lot of reasons for this. And one thing can you get capacity planning and auto scaling right, depending on your situation. Uh, if you have some huge things like Black Friday and so on, just it becomes hugely difficult to do in the data center because of this whole capacity planning, racks, purchasing of hardware. It's, it's, it's simply in our age, very, very difficult. And also, can you, do you want to solve the hard problem of fault tolerance by yourself? So just all this stuff like active, 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 passive stuff, it's hugely complex and it may, may cost you simply money and you have to guess and so on so where the cloud um, helps you a lot and also the serverless because just in the case of AWS it's just the services are in three different data centers so-called availability zones and so on of course it costs you money but then just you don't have to solve all these problems and everything fails all the time as you know so this is one of the main aspects we'll be talking about own less build more stuff and yeah, this is, yeah, if you're using serverless, 
it doesn't matter what uh, what provider you use this is you rely on uh, heavily on managed services so the the whole operational stuff will be managed for you and then becomes easier to implement new ideas because you mainly focus on the business logic and you can do simply more with the same amount of people relying on um on aws services on also on pay as you go models so just if you just starting to implement the idea at what will cost you some pennies so that's just not expensive if you don't do many users of course if you rely on the managed services just uh, you can e easily or much more easily evolve your architecture because it just doesn't contain too much code from your side and the cloud provider takes off yeah improving their own managed services and then we will also be talking about that serverless gives you as a consequence of owning less it's just lower technical debt and yeah um, i think i'm yeah, going back and this is the quote of paul johnson who is very yeah known person um, in the serverless space work what you write today it will be your tomorrow technical debt so you have to take care of your own code and also less code that you write or own also means um, lower technical debt and all this also means uh, lower maintenance yeah just and we probably know how how easy it's to get stuck in maintenance mode simply updating your dependencies freeing this from all the security vulnerabilities and all this stuff all this regular uh, law things like omnibus and um, cookie consent and everything that you know so if you own too much on much domains yeah, instead of using managed services like e-commerce managed service then it may impact you depending on the situation and uh, i think about the, the software just the, like the software about uh, the whole life cycle is just writing the solutions one thing maintaining the solution over the whole life cycle it's much more expensive so probably you will spend 75 percent time maintaining solution even more um yeah and only 25 percent just to write it so yeah if you free your time just by using all this uh, managed service just from on your core domain and then you you can focus on business value and innovation and probably this is something that every organization wants and every every manager every executive cries just i would like to focus on innovation on producing new things and yeah but this you can get faster time to market and i think that's the data into business if you just um, can focus on this and this is something that serverless enables you yeah, but you of course have to think about just what's your core domain we mentioned this so this was the value proposition of serverless in generally but with one dive and some other stuff like so our goal is just to cover own less build more stuff and also lower technical depth stuff so just how to do the stuff that we just how to rely on your cloud provider in this case it's aws just just to, to focus on, on, on these two aspects. And um, if we are talking about serverless at the AWS, I, I think about this as an operational construct. So AWS offers a lot of services which are completely not serverless or partially serverless, depending on the configuration. And everything on the right lacuna, they are quite purely serverless services. And this is what I mean if I'm talking about serverless, about S3. DynamoDB, Lambda, SQS, SNS, and so on. So I hope people are familiar with it's not the introduction talk about the serverless. So um, I hope you have basic understanding of the server uh, of, of, of some of the services. Um, so now we will just dive deeper how to write less code with um, AWS serverless services. And the first thing is most important just write fewer Lambda function. Lambda function is serverless. Yeah, execution environment of the programming uh, language which AWS supports, and mainly yeah, where you write your business logic, and you will see how just to, yeah to, to to write less of them, and, and one of the things is just use that so service integration, direct service integrations which AWS provides. We will see a lot of examples with API gateway with um step function with uh, with other stuff with event breach so you can skip writing your code if you simply um pass your 
parameters to, to another service, just uh, only tra transform the data and not transform them. Um, so, um, and in case you, ri uh, you write less uh, Lambda function, it means also you have to write less code, also to test less code and to maintain less code. If you write Lambda function, uh, you write it less, then it's also you reduce the ACI CD stack to maintain. It just uh, also very important, you reduce the infrastructure code, um, to maintain because you just have to provide your IAM policies, all this permission stuff, just you can minimize also this. You know the problems of cold start, just by writing a less lambda function, you just minimize all these headaches. And also um, point of failures, retire security concerns, all these lambda limits, you know, we, you, there are limits like how many concurrent lambda execution in total do you have per account, per region, and also, of course, the spending on Lambda on all this observability stuff of, of Lambda will be reduced um, heavily. So if you can reduce uh, the amount of, of Lambda function read and do this, we will see the architectures which enable this. And another stuff is also just write less infrastructure as a code. There are frameworks we will see at uh, uh, AWS Amplify, serverless framework components, and so on that allow you just also to generate a lot of stuff or just to rely on the framework to do the job you. So they will go for different architectures and there will be very uh, brief overview. You will see a lot of links below, just you can dive deeper depending on your use case. As you see, we'll touch upon nearly all, all services which are, um, yeah, which will be used in the context of the serverless. So the first thing, if you have some kind of API gateway and probably if you have the application which is yeah, open to outside of the world, you will use API gateway managed service to do uh, like this. And if you just want to call yeah, to, to call another service, you don't need the Lambda in bit API gateway enables integration with, I think, even 100 services, something like this, direct integrations without writing the code which calls another service. So uh, this is what you have to, um, and to to think about. So one use case is it's also from, from IP Labs. We are relying heavily on AWS and on serverless. Simply nearly everything that we implement or start implementing, we try to be as serverless as possible. So we are thinking, can we use all these managed services, serverless services or not? And this is one of the examples we have our products, we have our product groups and what we need is kind of ID generation, which is unique across all our systems, like product IDs, like product group IDs. And this is something which we have implemented by simply direct integration from um, API Gateway and DynamoDB. This is the di database we use for generating the sequence. And uh, we have done this by simply just uh, integrating them directly and um, simply letting us yes, uh, writing the template uh, velocity template which simply asks dynamo to get the um, yeah the next value of of the id and it's quite handy we could do this with lambda but just with always the disadvantages that i have mentioned so there are a lot of integrations from api gateway to sqs i think nearly every AWS service is just supported, so you can skip the Lambda if you just don't do some fancy stuff there. So also HTTP API is kind of alternative, um, lightweight alternative for API gateway. There is also storage uh, first service integration. There are a lot of services uh, that is supported like event bridge, like Kinesis, like SQS step functions and so on so just if you would like to connect it, connect the http api the storage then you have these options now we will be talking about event breach which allows us yeah, to use event bus to decouple consumer and producer and the same thing here if you just want to drop event just and then you need some of this which processes is there are a lot of direct integrations um the whole list is also very huge even um even breaches only available since two years i think 
if you use put targets, so just to put event, there are a lot of consumers. You see also API way, you will see SQS, SNS, so all, all the serverless services can be used as, as, as a part of, of the put target. But what is really nice with the event bridge, you can use API destination. You see this um, just to integrate it via REST with also the source side of AWS. And so you see the list of the services. You can use pager duty in case you, yeah, you use this for yeah, incident management. You have the Slack, you have Zendesk, nearly every service which which supports this integration can be integrated with um um with api uh with event which we, we newly introduced api destination so quite handy um and we also use this with the pager duty so another aspect of writing less code is just yeah there is a fan out pattern in case you wrote the event and then you have a lot of yeah a lot of consumers uh, which 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 would like to do something with the event but of course not every consumer is interested in all type of events and then you have can use this field in routing mechanism like to say okay i have the 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 the, the, the payload which consists of source attribute and i can apply the rule and say okay i have some producers which are only interested in the event um, in, in this event, if the source is in this case cast up um, and my uh, my app, so and other producer, other consumers won't receive this. So also very handy. Just you can, yeah, you can write the lambda function which checks something and then delegates and so on. This is the features uh, which uh, features which is natively available also on the event bridge side itself. The same is, is true for uh, notification service SNS. You also do filtering based on the message attributes. So you can use SNS service and uh, in case that you, you send notification and you have event type defined like order canceled, order placed and so on, you can define different producers depending on, on the attribute, attribute name and value, key value. So you can, in case, um, you see in case of event canceled or event place, you can, yeah, then you have the, the, the consumer SQS or the queue, which then delivers the message to the Lambda. And in case of uh, event type uh, page visiting, you have um, consumer, which is directly the Lambda function. And then you are doing things differently. So also very, very powerful pattern, yeah, similar to the, to the event bridge. Um, so talking about other architectures, the function is one of the services which also heavily um, used in the serverless space. It's just, yeah, you can um, do workflows and so on uh, with this. And uh, there are also very many services which can be, um, yeah, called from the step function directly. A breach is one of the latest thing that is introduced. They can just call the, um, yeah, put the event into the message bus from the uh, step function. So also a lot of powerful patterns just to skip the business logic uh, written in Lambda. I know that I'm probably too quick uh, because it's just a lot to cover. But what's interesting and what has been released, um, I think two months ago, in order to be productive with the um, step functions, yeah, you need this, this DSL, how to write all this, um, um, yeah, uh, step function looks like how just to, to, to write, um, yeah, um, what service, yeah, all this workflow management and so on, and just requires a, a huge cognitive load to understand this. And that's why the team of AWS released Workflow Studio. Uh, it's just for low code visual tool for building the state machines and workflows. And you can simply just drag and drop your stuff and you uh, get visual hints what uh, yeah how to how to do the stuff it just greatly reduce uh, what you need to know about this uh, this domains language um, to write the things so try the try it out just uh, to build the state machines and just see your code will be generated for you. and um, yeah and another example is 
in case you need to write Lambda for your business logic, um, what is really happening that you have the same pattern. So in case your Lambda has been executed successfully, probably you need, kind of, you need some kind of Lambda or notification service, but especially in case the Lambda failed, probably you need kind of message, yeah, that later queue or even using event breach and just the same logic. You are just doing this if else, if successful, do something, if not successful, something else. And just in order just to get rid of this and make this configurable, configurable, there is Lambda destination feature where you can simply, by defining Lambda, you can visually write the um, cloud formation and some other infrastructure as a code and define um, on the, yeah, via GUI or, or something like this, what is the logic, what should be called, and just don't include this into, the, into your code. <clears throat> Um, another example is DynamoDB serverless uh, database, so, uh, which is heavily used in, conte in context of the serverless uh, applications. The problem with this is uh, just the difficulty with the single table design. So it's also hugely different to the people who, who are used to, to, to use the, the relational databases, how to deal with NoSQL stuff. And so on, also for this, the no, no SQL workbench is created, which, which helps you to model the data, visualize your analysis, and also an operational build. So just try your queries out and so on. Um, so it, it makes probably easy just for you to, to figure out just this is something for you or not. I think this tool is on the earlier stage because sometimes what you need, you just bring your yeah, relational dependencies. You describe this like one to n, one to one, many to many dependencies, and um, yeah, sometimes you require suggestions from the tool how I can use single table design for this in the NoSQL area. I think that this tool is not quite far, but it's probably the goal just to enhance this tool that you can start by thinking in relational uh, mode, and then it will build. Um, this quite complex um, single uh, table designs, but they are quite effective and even quite cost effective in, in, in the serverless space. Also, another stuff, it, it, it wasn't um, easy just to export some Dynamo Debable into the S3. So just to, to, um, to export the content into, into the storage, you can start EMR jobs, data pipelines, or even use um, DynamoDB streams to, to write your business logic to do the stuff. Currently, this native integration, they are simply configure uh, doing exactly this. So simply select several things and then you can um, export the content of, of your DynamoDB table to S3. Um, I also see a lot of potential even to improve this because sometimes you don't need the whole contents. You would, you would like to shrink this depending on, on yeah, what 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 things do you need to there? And if you have everything in one table, probably you have different relationship there. And you just you would like to shrink to just uh, yeah, exporting some stuff. So there's also the the room for improvement, but also one of yeah, numerous introduced features. Uh, so. Another example is also we have been talking about SNS. Um, the great kids data, we are uh, data firehose. Um, among others, you see here a lot of other stuff like SQS integration with SNS, also Lambda integration and so on. But you see the newly introduced uh, Kinesis data warehouse, uh, firehouse uh, configuration, which itself enables natively integration with all type of storage like S3, like Redshift and so on, Elasticsearch. So you can use this for uh, analytics and other stuff because, yeah, this is the path uh, which, which which you can explore in case you just then uses Athena or S3 or, or something like this. So also enables you just natively integrating without writing too, too many business logic and so on. Yeah, probably we will wrap up uh, this part yeah 
just by mentioning that there is Amplify tool, which which helps you to write, um, yeah, to write your apps uh, using web frameworks like, yeah, JavaScript, React, Angular, Vue, Next.js, but also by generating the code for mobile platforms, Android, iOS, also using technologies with which provides you hybrid approaches like Flutter, like, and, and so on. Um, so native and, and hybrid approach. And um, this also heavily relies on managed services. So just you provide your model and many things, many integrations will be direct, uh, generated for you with scaffolding and so on, which we are probably familiar with. So very, very powerful um, tool and also, uh, last year, the, the admin UI have been introduced. They simply can model things and see uh, that the things are generated and then provides uh, actually with your application so you can just um, and do the thing. So Amplify relies on AppSync, which also re relies on GraphQL. So um, all these kinds of, of things are supported. Uh, it's probably worth uh, completely another talk. But what's really nice uh, and what are really nice about this Amplify that it also in ICI CD. So generally it provides you really nearly manage CI CD. So you write, yeah. So you model your dependencies, you will get a lot of for free and you only only have to to say where the where is your Git repository. It can be um yeah, manage Git, Git, it may be even AWS managed code commit. It can be also um, other managed uh, things are from like from Atlassian and so on. And then they will generate the whole pipelines for you with AWS native services like code, called, uh, code build, code pipeline and deploy this and even configure main and so on. Uh, so it's, I see just another potential uh, that you don't spend too much time on CI, CD in, in, in many situations. It's just, yeah, you see the code, yeah, yeah, there are the tests and then just everything else can be generated by your cloud provider. So also very, very powerful and just check it out. There is also... Yeah, there is a serverless framework, like an alternative for writing serverless um, applications and the serverless framework components. I think it's commercial part, but they also provide you ready components so that you can reduce writing your infrastructure as a code and also relying on this. So yeah, if you're using serverless framework, so check this out. But generally, yeah, the last 15 minutes have been fully packed with all this stuff but you see some general patterns. So direct service integrations to reduce them out of code written, you have seen a lot of stuff like API gateway, HTTP API, step functions, event bridge, SNS, Amplify, all these yeah, different use cases provide you all these direct integrations that you can just, yeah, can use the power of these tools. Another pattern is you see visual tools which help you reduce the cognitive load like step function, visual studio, Amplify, admin UI, but also DynamoDB Workbench is one of the example. And um, also automated CI CD focus on the business logic. We've seen this with Amplify and I see the, the, the same. This is also the tool from um, AWS itself to build serverless application. Uh, they also go into the direction to, to ease you CI CD process. So I think we have 15 minutes left. And as you see it, so this is what uh, Werner Vogels told. So how the future of development will look like. So all the code you ever write is the business logic. Yeah, it's very optimistic and currently probably many will say it's not very realistic, but this is the direction and how AWS sees this, the whole ecosystem, especially the ecosystem of the serverless services. It's just how they develop them, it's just, yeah, that you can focus on your business logic and everything else is just have to be done. And of course you have limitations if you use something just which is already built in and not very highly configurable. You may lose some flexibility, but you d you will keep your focus on, on, on what's, what matters. So generally, if you will 
use serverless ecosystem, it doesn't matter what cloud provider, yeah, it will significantly lower your tenuous and germane cognitive load, also the amount of code written, and also the amount of dependencies. So you just, yeah, you don't have to manage your execution runtime like, like G GDK and so on, but also the web application service also abstracted away behind API gateway and so on. So this is the important part. But of course, um, reducing dependencies doesn't mean that you own nothing. Yeah, you still own things. You you own less, but you have to take uh, care about things. So if you are using Lambda language, uh, Lambda, um, then <clears throat> the yeah, you, you are selecting the, the the runtime version. Yeah, like Node.js, like Java 8, 11, and so on. And AWS retires them from time to time. They cannot um, manage all of them forever. So like we've got the message that Node.js below 10 will be retired completely. And also eight time will be migrated from the Oracle GDK to the Amazon yeah, alternative, which is Coreto. So then you have to, to see if, if something breaks yeah, uh, and up update this. And also the same stuff if you are using Aurora database, which is yeah, Postgres and MySQL compatible. Yeah, I will get the notice like what if you are relying on Postgres with the version 9.6, then it won't be um, supported anymore and it will be automatically upgraded to 12 if you just don't upgrade it to um, to 10 or so, even to 12. So you have to take care, you have to plan upgrades, but of course it's just a bit less generally. Yeah, I have the, the web application server in this context and so on, but still you have to own things. Yeah, we have a, a bit of time, so I would like just to share something how to be successful with serverless in general, because yeah, um, there are a lot of caveats and yeah, it, I think it's, there are some things which, which are true also for other kind of microservices um, environments. Um, so it's about software delivery and operational excellence. And when I'm talking about this, I, I always reference this wonderful book, Accelerate, from Nicole Fosgren, Jess Humble, Jim Keen. Uh, which has been released three years ago. I think that's the most fundamental book I have read about software. And uh, what they're talking about is that there are four key metrics which combine speed and quality. For example, yeah, deployment frequency and lead time for changes. These are metrics for, for the speed and time to restore service and change failure rate. This is the metrics for quality. And what they say that the highly um, um, successful companies, they don't uh, trade one for another. Yeah. And if you are just in the high or elite group, then they can combine this. Um, but the question is, yeah, how to combine this? And this is yeah, the focus on, on operational excellence, on the performance excellence. And just you see uh, the red that there are things that help. And just use cloud, the usage of cloud helps with yeah, delivery and operational performance. Of course, you see the code maintainability. They mean the same way we have been talking about evolutionability. Yeah, and you see loosely coupled architecture and serverless architects are very loosely coupled. Yeah? So this is the key feature. Yeah, using all these um, yeah services like event breach and so on, which allow you. Uh, to, to to write these things, and we are, have been talking how to minimize the code. Uh, amount of code being written, which helps you with maintainability, so on and so on. So there are some best practices, and I and, and I see that using serverless will help you generally uh, with all this approach. So probably I will I will see part. Uh, uh, there are some examples how can you do uh, canary deployments with the serverless. You can look. Um, at this later because yeah doing this continuous deployment um also helps you with time to restore because you can just automatically roll back and so on um i will probably wrap up the talk with some kind of um stuff so by serverless is kind of 
paradigm shift. Yeah, and all the paradigms, um, like the shift from relational to NoSQL databases, just you cannot use the old methods to be successful. Yeah, if you use relational data modeling and NoSQL stuff, probably it will fail, and it's just not because NoSQL database, yeah, doing something wrong, so you are using this wrongly. And the same is for serverless. So you have uh, to, to embrace some best practices in order to be successful with this. And this is uh, the last would like to share. So the first one, what that you need to be successful is just to adopt true DevOps. There is, um, yeah, the, the links to the DevOps topologies below, they describe the patterns and anti-patterns using DevOps. Th this comes from the same people which wrote the book Team Topologies, which I have talked uh, in the beginning. And mainly for the server, there is only one um, best practice, and this is fully shared ops responsibilities by the devs. So you have one team of people and they are sharing the, the devs and the ops stuff. So you won't be successful uh, if you just have kind of uh, people only focusing on ops or even decoupled ops in this context. So it may be the case that that, that you, if you have some kind of monolithic, applica uh, monolithic application, then there, then there may be a situation that you can be successful, but generally with the serverless, uh, the devs should do the ops stuff and then ops also need to do dev stuff. Complete infrastructure automation is probably true for all kinds of cl uh, cloud operations. So just if you can uh, automate CI, CD, then you probably lose the time or then simply use the service which brought many CI, CD like Amplify. Chaos engineering is highly important because this is distributed mon uh, application and so on. So the things may break. You need to figure out how it just works. But Many of serverless services, they just highly available, highly fault tolerant, but any anyway, also Lambda fail, so they will be retried and just, you have to think about this, also have to think about how to write um, the code, which, which is either important in order to enable these retries and so on. So you need in depth responsibility in the teams because, um, yeah, it, yeah, it may be expensive. You have to to allow developers think about money, so understand the price model of the services, and of course they ha they need access to all this invoice stuff from AWS. If just simply decoupled and only your financial may look at this, so cost reduction may become a feature like <laughs> yeah, like security, like performance, and so on, because. You also need to iterate. You choose the service, and then you see, okay, yeah, does it feed? Probably, you have uh, expand functions, which you probably need to write in other programming language, yeah, which quicker, uh, yeah, and so on. So you need to embrace this stuff. And what I really like with the serverless, each team, each developer, in theory, can have access to its own AWS test account. Yeah, so test account per developer, even per developer and feature is possible because in the pay as you go model, you're mainly paying for the storage being used, but in this staging test environment, you don't use too much. Of course, there are limitations. You cannot create unlimited accounts because of service quotas and so on, but generally it's possible. So it, yeah, so you can, if you automate everything, then it be easier to test and just, uh, yeah, every, every, everybody his own account uh, for testing. Also, what I see is only minimal local testing with the uh, serverless because it's very difficult to mimic uh, serverless services on the, your local machine. So AWS gives you some possibilities, but you lose all the quotas and you lose some integration. You also lose um, um, identity and access management and so on. So this is for quick unit tests, functional tests, it's possible, but generally uh, you can set up the whole environment with some delay, it may take several minutes, but you can do a real testing on the staging environment. But many people also say, okay, this whole stuff with testing environment, it costs time and it doesn't, it doesn't really, it's not, yeah, if you don't have a real user behavior there. So for some small tests, it's good, but uh, for some stuff, 
people use the real life environments because it's just yeah this the, the, this the state of your application so also uh, think about how ado uh, to adopt testing in action and Nick is providing some sandboxing there and so on it's um, uh, really interesting thing so I recommend the, the link below the talk of Michael Brzezik what do you know about testing in production he also described the challenges of staging environment and so on so I think it was the last slide yeah so thank you very much I know that it was probably too much information or yeah going too quickly about too many topics so I will share my slides and now I'm open to questions. I see that Scotty also wrote that, 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 you, that you can ask them. And anyway, I'm available also via Twitter, via email, and so on. So thank you very much for the invitation once again.